Welcome to The Virtual Shift, a show looking at the seismic changes happening in healthcare with virtual care at the epicenter. Join me and my guests as we look at key cultural and policy shifts impacting how providers, payers, and patients connect, as well as how care is being reimagined both for today and the future. Hello, and thanks for tuning in today. I'm your host, Tom Foley. You can learn more about this show by visiting the program on healthcarenowradio.com, and be sure to follow me on LinkedIn, Twitter, at Foley Tom and the hashtag, The Virtual Shift. Hello, thanks for tuning in. I'm your host, Tom Foley, and I am joined today by Dr. Chris Elliott. He is the founder and chief regulatory officer at Lehman Micro Devices. Dr. Elliott, welcome to the program. Thank you very much. Great to be here. It's exciting to have you on because you bring this unique perspective of how medical devices uh, are injected into the delivery of care model in a very unique way. Uh, They could be uh, obtrusive or they could be integrated into what consumers use every day uh, in in context of how they could do a better job in monitoring first uh, of their own conditions before uh, the medical devices get injected into a a hypothetical, the remote patient monitoring arena. So that all said, this market is challenged globally doesn't matter what geography you're talking about, we all have the same challenge. We have a growing population, aging population, that aging population contracting more and more chronic condition, older age or sicker population with less doctors and nurses available to treat that population. The question is, how do you deliver care in that model? Any opening comments on that front? Uh, Yeah, well, we started off um, now nine or 10 years ago with a whole vision about the consumer. Our aim right from the start was to say, that medical devices are caught in a vicious circle. They're expensive, so you don't sell very many, so they're expensive. So we started this company by saying, what can we do if we start off by assuming we're going to do something really useful at low cost? We're going to take the consumer product model. We'll make a low cost device. That means we'll sell large numbers, which means we'll make high volume production. So we'll have to have mass production technology, which makes it cheap. And that's the virtuous circle. And we started off with a business model that looked like that. And then we said, well, what are, what are lots of people want to know? And what they want to do is measure real health parameters, not toys, not useless things that look good on a screen, but don't actually tell you about your health. What are the things people really worry about? And we converged in on really two major ones, which is blood pressure and body temperature, because they're the two things. The first thing happens when you go and see a doctor, they check those two. So we said, can we put that in everybody's hands, not just a few people, not just the sick, but the well consumers? Uh, So that's our first step. Can we make sensing that will do that for people, for the consumer? And secondly, can we get it to them? How do we take it to market? Because the problem with these things is how do we get it to people? And our solution was to make it either so cheap that people will either give it away. I mean, we're, we're talking at the moment with a couple of health providers who just want us to make our devices and they'll give them to all their patients. Um, but the better way, if we can, is actually to link it in with the mobile phone. If we make it part of a mobile phone, the mobile phone companies, the best marketeers in the world, if we give them something to market, they'll do the work for us. So that was our original concept and still says true. What we've ended up with is building a sensor, which is the only... And I'm absolutely certain of this, the only device in the world that can measure your blood pressure to clinical accuracy and is small enough and cheap enough to be built into a phone. We've got the solution. It works. They're in production. It's highly patented. It's there. So we, we, we're very confident. We've got a great sensor, which, and we've also got a string of um, add-ons. We've done things like measuring heart valve timing with it. We've got a pretty good model for how we will measure blood viscosity hydration levels, all with the same device. And suddenly, we're looking at something that everyone has in their phone, just like the camera. It's with you all the time. Whether you're sick or healthy, which actually says you've got a problem. And and just to put that in context, I mentioned blood pressure. We Over the last couple of years, we've all got pretty excited about COVID, COVID being a real killer. It's killed probably 4 million people in the world. Since we started worrying about COVID, 15 million have died from high blood pressure. And most of them died because they didn't know it. If they knew they'd got a problem, there's cheap medication. You can change your lifestyle. You can change your diet and you solve it. Instead, people die early 
Well, by the time they get to see a doctor, that's too late. So just that simple thing. Can you measure your blood pressure with your phone? If you can, then you're going to get the early warning that says, hey, I've got a problem. And we've got the only device that can do it. And it's, uh, it's interesting because uh, you raised an interesting perspective in that patients go to the doctors when it hurts. Uh, mm. If there's no pain involved, they ain't going, even for annual checkups, right? So some do, obviously, but you know, in general, doctors are looked at as I got pain, I got to schedule an appointment, I got to wait three weeks, and yep. then you know go to a specialist and I got to wait another three weeks, right? So that doesn't work in the context of I'm sick now. Or quite frankly, I am sick, but I don't I don't even know it. So half of half of the diabetics out there don't know they have diabetes. To your point, yep. half of the people with hypertension don't know they have hypertension because they never got checked for it. So the this 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 consumerism, this in consumer empower empowerment is really about how they can take action uh, with some very credible devices not consumer devices, but, uh, you know, medical devices yeah. that can help them measure their current state of wellness. And to your point, if you go onto my website, you, you and I have known each other for six plus years, you know, the simplicity of putting your index finger on the back of your smartphone to measure your, your blood pressure is like easy peasy, Yeah, but it's, um, it's kind of a, but it's out of the norm because people think old fashioned, if you will, and that you need something on your bicep in order yeah. to measure it correctly. Thoughts on that? Yeah, it's 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 part of a, a a bigger change. I mean, clearly, you can see how it immediately fits in with telehealth and remote patient monitoring because, well, we're working with a couple of telehealth providers, as I say, that that want to issue these to their their patients. So that's the the current model of health, but made more efficient. I always quote Henry Ford's line, if he'd asked his customers what they want from him, they'd have said faster horses. And telehealth is faster horses. It's doing what we've always done, but with with sensors, we can, we can make it a lot better and we can avoid all those trips into the, the doctor's office. So, you know, you, it's interesting to speculate when, when you're doing telehealth and you're looking at that, that kind of service. If in the middle of a consultation, you could say to your patient, oh, could I just have a look at your ECG, please? Or EKG, depending on what you know it as. You know, our device, like, like now this is not unique. There are others on the market, but they're more expensive. You put your two fingers on the back and it gives you a one lead ECG. Bang. And that's, that's now becoming established. Uh, in my home country in the UK, the health service is actually issuing the uh, the Alive Core device to people because it it saves money for the health service. But that's all part of the now, and we we are very keen to work with those people because uh, you know it's it's a it's a market for us and it's a way to get it established. But the the thing I, I look at it's very hard to make predictions about the future; they're usually wrong. But it is interesting to look at analogies, and the one that I think is closest is personal banking. Because like you say, I think that the sort of technologies we're talking about are the thin end of a wedge. And if you look at what happened in personal banking, I, I'm old enough. You know, it was over 40 years ago when I first went to university. And I went, my father took me to meet the bank manager, a real person who shook my hand and said, very nice to meet you, young Elliot, you know. Um, and I opened a bank account and it was all it was all very personal and slow and inefficient. And the banks latched on to personal technology. And suddenly they found that they could save costs. They love it. But what they hadn't realized was it's completely revolutionized banking. And we're no longer humble and subservient to the bank manager because he doesn't exist anymore. They're gone. We now do all our banking online. Our relationship to our bank is completely changed. We're the consumer. We say, now I want this. And if you look at booking a taxi, 10 years ago, if you wanted a taxi, you pick up the phone. And you phone the local taxi company, they say, we'll be there in 10 minutes. Doesn't matter what the traffic is, whether they've got a car, they always say 10 minutes because there's nothing you can do about it. Along comes the Uber business model. And suddenly I'm in charge. I look at the, I can decide not to take the offer. And you could taxis, you could dating, you look at navigation. The, the point was the technology was an incremental change, but it led to a revolution. 
It's interesting because I, I had a conversation this morning with a device manufacturer, and he was drawing this perception that the cheaper the, the device cost-wise was an indication of the device's consistency and accuracy. And uh, so, uh, what do you what are your thoughts on that? Because some would say, "Hey, it's you know, it's it's an i watch, it's a it's an Apple Watch, right? It's not clinically relevant, but people a lot of people use it to measure their their vitals." How do you get over the hump of changing the perception that a small chip uh, that sits in the back of a smartphone or external device that that is clinically accurate and consistent in its accuracy is is the better way to go? Uh, I've got a three-letter answer, or actually a five-letter answer. Okay. FDA and the two letters are CE in Europe. This we, we're just preparing the dossier at the moment. This will come out with an FDA stamp of approval. Now, we've got to be very careful about that because FDA doesn't let you approve it clears devices. Similarly, the CE mark says the same. The CE mark says that it complies with the standards. We're testing this against exactly the same ISO standards as a conventional cuff blood pressure meter, a conventional finger clip pulse oximeter, blood, uh, blood oxygen meter. We're testing it exactly the same standards. We're submitting exactly that to the FDA. And to be fair on Apple, though I don't see why I should, but to be fair on Apple, the watch is not the key point. The watch software has been FDA approved. It's been cleared by the FDA as a class two medical device. It doesn't do very much, but what it does is accurate. And that's why the FDA cleared it. And it's also cleared in the, with a CE mark in Europe. So the, the answer is that's, that's why we have the FDA. That's why we have the CE system in Europe. Because it's a protection against the snake oil salesman. And there's plenty of those in the medtech industry. There's a nice, I mean, WoW is very insistent at the beginning of this that we've got the only device in the world that measures blood pressure. There's loads of things you can find that, on your phone that say they measure your blood pressure. Most of them don't work. The ones that do, and there are a few good ones, measure the change in the blood pressure from the last time you put the right answer in, having measured it on a cuff. So in other words, they're really good. If you tell them what your blood pressure is, they'll tell you what it is. Now, that's not much use. Once you know you've got a problem, that's useful. But the point about our device, because it's absolute, it does the same as a cuff, it tells you you've got a problem before you knew it. And that's the way this technology is going. I mean, it'll take some time for people to accept because if it's cheap, they suspect it. But uh, the, the, it's the good housekeeping seal of approval from the regulators that, that we're relying on. In Europe, in America, in India, in China, we're applying to all of them because that is what marks us out as having a real medical product. Interesting. If you're just tuning in, you're listening to The Virtual Shift. I'm your host, Tom Foley, and we're talking to Dr. Chris Elliott, founder and chief regulatory officer at Lehman Micro Devices. So, what you're suggesting here is that there is new ch- technology on the horizon that will further empower uh, the consumer to engage in monitoring their wellness well before they need a physician to engage. Is that fair to say? No, not to replace the physician, but you know, it's always good to check your blood pressure once in a while and same with other uh, vitals. Uh, thoughts on that? Yeah, well, it's, in fact, it's, it's, you said the once in a while is an interesting point because human bodies aren't like cars or, com- or computers. They, they vary a lot. Well, actually, maybe computers uh, wander around in practice as well, but as we know, but uh, the, the human body is, is remarkable. When you measure your blood pressure, and people say, what's your blood pressure? Well, you know, I measure mine a lot because I'm testing our devices often. And it's, uh, it, it'll be, uh, you know, 110 over 73 one day, and it'll be 145 over... 95 the next day and in fact over two minutes it may change if if i'm uh, in a meeting it'll go up by 20 because i'm i'm concentrating so the concept of what is my blood pressure is meaningless what you've got to do is track it and measure it a lot yeah uh, you're, you're raising a good point so i'll just use in the u.s uh, the average medicare patient with five chronic conditions sees nine different doctors uh, they're only in front of the doctor 15 hours in a given year in a total in total so when you go to the doctor and you get measured, that is a an event 
not a a a, a statistic yeah. that you hold on to for the for the remaining uh, 364 days of the year, right? So the point is that you have to uh, constantly measure yourself to ensure that things aren't developing because you keep eating that jelly donut or you you lack your exercise or you uh mm. in your steps and, and things of that nature so you know a good uh housekeeping relative to maintaining wellness is monitoring yourself uh both in what you how you exercise how you eat as well as your vitals themselves because you could be a you know some people look at the the thinness of an individual as a as a and a muscular physique of an individual as a sign of wellness when in fact that is not necessarily true uh it's always good regardless of uh age shape or size to engage in monitoring yourself and what you're saying is hey you don't have to go out and spend five hundred dollars seven hundred dollars on a medical device to do that you could if your smartphone manufacturer or other device manufacturers would integrate it uh there's a there's a different way on on the horizon thoughts yeah that that's certainly true making it available to everybody and it's actually more of an issue in other parts of the world in in the relatively wealthy west in in states in europe you know a few hundred dollars may be possible but uh, our, our our, our customers are interested in particularly India, sub-Saharan Africa is a big, big area. Lots of people have got smartphones because they need them for trade, but they they haven't got access to medical technology. A lot of the world needs that. There's, uh, there's something like 400 million hypertensives in India. There's mm. about 350 million in China. Uh, and that's just a guess because, you know, they haven't all been measured. So, yeah, there's there's making it readily available. But I wanted to pick up on something you just said about the number of different doctors you see, because uh, you know I, I, I have to be careful to my medical friends because I'm an engineer and a lawyer, but I'm I, so I'm I'm definitely uh, not a doctor. But what I've noticed in my two other professions is that most of the practitioners are reductionists. They want to reduce everything to a simple cause and effect, and and bodies aren't like that. They're much more complex, and we see some interesting possibilities. What, what happens at the moment, if you take complex conditions, uh, I, I'm the ones that have many different presentations, many different triggering factors, but maybe somewhere in the middle is a common root cause if we can find it. And one example, which I, I know a bit about is uh, what's sometimes called chronic fatigue syndrome, myelagia, fibromyalgia, myelagic encephalomitis, Brain, dis- brain fog. There's a whole load of things. It might be linked to autoimmune. Long COVID might be related. One of the things that's very, when you have those symptoms, every time you see a doctor, the doctor sees the symptoms in which she or he is an expert. And the old phrase about if you've got a hammer, everything looks like a nail is very applicable. So someone close to my family has those conditions. And, and she was told she got depression. She had a nutritional deficiency. She had uh, some sort of um, inherited condition. The, the, each doctor she saw told her something different. Now, what I found fascinating was that she borrowed my phone, which has got an AI diagnostic device, system on it. It's got uh, the ADA system. And she tapped away for about 10 minutes entering her symptoms. At the end of it said, there's a 70% chance that you've got fibromyalgia. Now, no one had ever said that to her before. It's actually a recognized condition. And what, what have they done? It's nothing special. It's just boiled out all the best wisdom from hundreds of doctors into an AI system. And it's objective. It doesn't say, I'm a rheumatologist. I see this person with aching bones. So she, clearly she's got rheumatism. It didn't say that. It said, tell me all your symptoms. Now, if you think about what would happen if we come back to ubiquitous sensors, we've got, we're measuring things on our bodies to medical standards all the time. And so my, my speculation is, is um, it's a breeding experiment. What happens if these third generation sensors like ours, they get together and they mate with artificial intelligence systems. The fourth generation, their children, are going to make a complete transformation because they are going to be the ones that use the very best systematic analysis and are not deflected by prejudice, by personal expertise, by narrowness, we're suddenly looking at a completely different model of the practice of medicine from the one that we've had ever since Hippocrates two and a half thousand years ago. That's a real change. 
I yeah, would agree. It's actually that merger of the device, yeah. the, the data in and of itself, and how do you analyze that data? Do you think that this is an area where there needs to be a regulatory shift in that, you know, don't make the diagnosis, platform uh, providers are hesitant to produce an AI platform that is robust enough where you say, hey, 50% chance you got hypertension, 70% chance you got yeah. X, Y, or Z. Because again, uh, I want to know, but I'm maybe I was just diagnosed with diabetes and I was, I want to say, what the heck is diabetes? I, you know what I mean? Yeah. So, and even if you were diagnosed and your blood pressure is on the climb, you look at your measure every day. Uh, let's just use remote patient monitoring. You see it's 16 times a month, right? Hypothetically by yeah. regulation. So, but you don't, you you don't, yeah, yeah, you see an incremental climb or, but you don't see the trend in that. So an AI tool will, will identify the trend and bring that to you. It's the same way as the measuring your glucose level, right? Yeah. You know, you think you can get away with that, uh, that jelly donut, but if you eat it too many times, you, you know, you're just not going to, you're not going to meet your measures, right? So right. you got to do, you got to do something. So that's where, again, Older age or second population, less doctors and nurses, my view is what fills the gap is AI to some degree. Medical devices, data, and AI to be that coach, not not to perform diagnosis, but to be a coach in that, hey, and if it's worth bad enough, hey, go see a doctor. But you could say, hey, maybe you should start exercising a couple of days a week. Thoughts? That's certainly, yeah, the kind of life coach approach. Clearly right. that can be done. But, I mean, you, you, you raised the point, the very good point about this being advisory and, and do we need better regulation? Now, FDA is, is leading the world in thinking about regulating these things. I think you, there's some very clever people there who are very aware of the sort of things you're asking. One of the things that strikes me, putting my, my legal hat on, incidentally, because I'm a British uh, trial lawyer, I do have a wig. Uh, we do wear them still in British courts. I, I uh, Putting my legal hat on, if I've got a piece of a diagnostic equipment of any kind that comes up with a recommendation, I'm flying pretty close to a malpractice suit if I don't follow the recommendation. So you may say it's only advisory and you talk to your doctor, but it's going to be a brave doctor who goes against that advisory information. So I think we need to, with a lot of work we've got to do in the, the ethics, the regulation, as well as the technology, to catch up with what's going to happen. This, this, is, this is happening all the time. I said, my, my example of the uh, fibromyalgia diagnosis just knocked me out because I'd, I'd never seen anything so simple. And this is, I have to say, this is a free version of the app doing that. And all it did was ask questions. You start linking that in with the kind of third generation sensors that we're now selling, and you're going to get, who knows? I mean, it's, that's why I said it's difficult to predict. But if you look at banking, what started off as just a, a bit of technology to make us more efficient has ended up transforming an industry. And, and I just see that happening in health. And we and, and I sorry, and I pick on that word and not wellness, staying healthy, particularly because FDA clearly distinguishes between health devices and wellness devices. But what we're talking about is actively staying healthy, actively mm -hmm. being at the top of your game rather than passively doing something after it goes wrong. Uh, and it's it's all part of that transformation. Uh, we we would agree. You know, six out of ten globally adults have m one or more chronic conditions. The greatest thing that we can do to reduce the cost of healthcare is to reduce the development of more and more yes. chronic conditions as we go. So if we focus on healthy, then uh, I think we'll, and that's going to be a 30, 40 year trend, right? People that are 40 are already not, yeah. paying, uh, have already passed the curve, hypothetically, of uh, all well on their way of developing chronic conditions. So uh, I use 40 as a hypothetical number, but uh, the, you, you understand my point. Yeah. Uh, so when can we expect to see uh, the technology that you spoke about? Well, there are some things on the market now. Uh, we're, we're preparing the dossier now for submission to FDA. So we're looking for clearance early next year, early 2022. Oh, so you're uh, you're close. I uh, yeah. yeah. I, so you're not yeah, talking two, three, four years out. You're talking oh, no. 2022 sometime. Obviously, if uh, if if uh, FDA and CE are, uh, clears the device, you're suggesting that you know the world could see a much different place in the context of the class of medical device uh, maybe that's the wrong word but the integration of medical devices into products that they already are well familiar with such as a smartphone yeah we're starting to see it now with with devices that link to the that are attached to the phone or linked to it it's starting to happen 
ours is uh, in production. We've oh, we've made about ten thousand for for testing, but we've got a, a our production company has just taken an order for fifty thousand from us. So that'll be the ones we'll be putting through the the trial batches to satisfy all the regulation. And we're working with a couple of manufacturers, actually four or five now, who are doing prototyping, yeah. how they build it into their devices. I'm smiling inwardly because we've known each other for a few years and I I feel I'm a bit like nuclear fusion. You know, it's the technology that's just around the corner and always will be. But we, we, we're now getting... Uh, it, it, it wasn't easy to do technically to get a device this small and cheap. The device itself is very simple. It's yeah. actually... And, and it's all public. I mean, you know, we, you can read our patents. We have no secrets about the technology. The tricky bit was the software to interpret the data. And that's the thing that we will be regulating, much as the same way as Apple regulated right. the software for the watch, not the watch itself. Because, let's like say, the, the sensor is pretty simple. It's all just standard components. The tricky bit is getting the software to deal with the vagaries of how people put their fingers on a device. Or, you know, I've got one here in my hand. If I want to measure my temperature, I bring it up to my forehead. And if I do that too quickly, it gives a, an error message. And all of that sort of thing. To make it easy to use... We've got a, a contract running now with a, a, a video games company who are building effectively a video game that you will you will play and it will give you points for making measurements and it will reward you uh, and it will hold your hand. It, it, it takes you through a garden and you water your plants by making measurements. I mean, it's all silly stuff, but it's actually what makes it user friendly. Exactly. And we want to say, you know, this is this is just part of your normal life. As a consumer, you expect you turn the key on the car, it works. You expect, you know, your bank account to be there. We just expect all this to be there and working. So, Dr. Elliott, great conversation. Uh, we have about 30 seconds left. Any closing remarks you want to make in regards to how this market is shifting towards consumerism and how the consumer can empower themselves to their individual and uh, personalized path to uh, healthy? For the consumer, the answer is be aware of it. You know, don't just consult Dr. Dr. Google, which is everyone's favorite medical practitioner. You know, actually get some facts, get some numbers, because in the end, those are what matter. For the medical practitioner, certainly looking at telehealth and RPM, that's, you know, the, that's the first step. But I mean, my, my real point for uh, aging rock, rock fans like me is you ain't seen nothing yet. It's going to be a revolution driven by technology, just like it has been in all the rest of consumer affairs. And it's going to happen. Dr. Elliott, awesome conversation. I appreciate you taking the time to uh, come on the program and uh, tell us about the innovative things that you're doing at uh, Lehman Micro Devices. Thank you. Anybody who invites me to spend half an hour talking about my baby is very welcome. Have a great day. I would like to thank the show sponsors, both HP and Intel. HP Engage long lifecycle products provide the stability, safety, and security you need, plus flexibility and performance designed for today and tomorrow. As well, Intel would like you to know we're going above and beyond together with new standards for business with the latest Intel vPro processors, delivering what IT needs for performance, security, remote manageability, and stability. And be sure to check out the program page on healthcarenowradio.com. And remember, connect or follow me on LinkedIn, Twitter, at Foley Tom, and follow the show's hashtag, The Virtual Shift. I'm Tom Foley. Until the next shift.